Today, we are going to be discussing three hacks to crush small stakes poker. You have to realize that to beat the small stakes games for the maximum amount possible, you must, you must, you must, you must get well out of line to take advantage of the things your opponents do incorrectly. You have to exploit them. However, you need to first make sure you're focused on good fundamentals. You need to know roughly what reasonable poker looks like. And then you need to learn to adjust to take advantage of the mistakes that your opponents are clearly making. And you'll consistently find spots where you should never be balanced. I think a lot of people get in their minds, especially people who watch a little bit of YouTube videos here, that either you must be GTO or you must be exploitative. But if you ask any good, strong, world-class player, it's a mix of both because if you don't know what your opponents are doing wrong, you can't really exploit them because you're oblivious to it, right? But once you know what they are doing incorrectly, that's when you get way out of line and take advantage of whatever that is that they're doing wrong. So in this webinar, we're going to be talking about three hacks that will help you crush live one to no limit cash games and small stakes and medium stakes soft tournaments today in 2023. So today, we're going to be discussing three hacks that will help you make more money. And those three hacks are preflop hacks that will have you having an aggressive image that will result in you getting paid off when you actually have a good hand. We'll also be discussing some postflop hacks that will help you learn situations where you should be very unbalanced, completely unbalanced, because there are some spots where your opponents will literally never or close enough to never bluff. Then we're also going to give you some bank roll hacks to ensure that you have the best shot at longevity. So number one preflop hack is to simply be more aggressive. Almost everyone plays too passively in poker games, myself included to some extent. The problem with playing passively is it causes you to constantly bleed chips while you're just waiting around to make the nuts against someone, while you're waiting to cooler them, right? But that is not really how you become a big winner. Sure, you may be a small winner if you just sit there and blind out for 50 hands, make the nuts, your opponent gives you a stack some portion of the time, right? That's fine if your opponents are oblivious. But most people today are not necessarily oblivious. They're doing their best to beat you, and they're not going to pay you off if you don't put any money in the pot. So you need to get in the action, right? So three rules that will make sure you're playing aggressively and intelligently are first, when you open the action, when it folds to you and you want to play, always raise. Do not open limp. Get it out of your mind, especially in cash games where they take a rake out of every pot. Limping is detrimental because when you limp, the casino just takes 10% of your money. It's hard to win when the casino is taking 10% of your money, even if you're playing okay hands, right? You'd much rather raise and have your opponents fold or call and have the pot be bigger and then you can potentially build a bigger pot to where the rake becomes less meaningful in every individual hand. Next, you need to be three betting constantly, either with a polarized strategy or a linear strategy. We're gonna discuss that in a bit. And also, when someone who is normally tight, passive, straightforward, clearly wants to put their stack in the pot, when it's obvious they want to put their stack in the pot, get out of the way, right? Just because you're being loose and aggressive does not necessarily mean that you have to put your money in with nothing, especially if you know that your opponents are only going to put their money in with good, strong hands. So first things first, you need to raise when you enter the pot. This gives you preflop fold equity, meaning you just win the blinds and ante if you're in a tournament, which may not seem that meaningful, but it actually is. If you can pick up one and a half big blinds with any hand uncontested, it's quite nice. And also, this is going to let you play post-flop as the aggressor, which is very, very good as well, because typically the aggressor is going to over-realize their equity, because whenever the pre-flop caller fails to make any sort of hand, they're just going to check and fold to a bet on the flop, which is great. So let's take a look at these two ranges we have here. This is 100 big blinds deep from the low jack in a 1-2 no limit hold'em cash game. The low jack is under the gun if you're playing six-handed. So take a look at this. You may find that this is actually tighter than you naturally play. This is a situation where most people raise any pair, most people raise any suited connector, 
Most people raise every queen jack offsuit or ace nine offsuit, but that's gonna have you being a little bit too loose if your opponents play well, if your opponents are three betting you adequately. Now, most players in most games do not actually three bet adequately, which will actually allow you to raise slightly wider than the chart here. Notice here also, the chart likes to play these low king x suited. This is something a lot of players are oblivious to. We did a, a little brain fuel on mo Monday morning. We have a Monday morning show. Make sure you check it out. Whenever I'm in town, I make a point to do that on Monday mornings at 9 a.m. Eastern. And someone said, wow, I can't believe you're supposed to raise the king five suited. Well, look, the king five suited is roughly break even. To be fair, most of these hands that are only raising some port portion of the time are roughly break even. But they give you better board coverage and, you know, you want to play as wide as you reasonably can, right? And like I said, if your opponents are not going to be three betting you often enough, then you can actually raise a little bit wider. So if you put me in the low jack seat, which is under the gun if you're six-handed, I would raise any ace x suited, king five suited and better, ace ten offsuit and better, king ten offsuit and better, probably queen jack offsuit as well. Queen nine suited, jack nine suited, nine eight suited, eight seven suited, seven six, six five five four suited, and then something like pocket fours and better, maybe pocket twos and better. But that's about as wide as you can reasonably raise. If you, for some reason, know your opponents are just like literally never going to three bet you, perhaps you can raise a few more suited hands, like 10-8 suited, 9-7 suited, etc. But even then, that's, that's pretty wide. So from the early position, you have to realize you just can't get too out of line because you're taking whatever hand you have against the other five hands remaining at the table that are essentially random, right? So you're taking whatever hand you have against five random hands, and you have to realize that like king nine suited's not in great shape from out of position against five random hands. It just isn't. So that's why you have to be a little bit careful raising with hands that are especially weak, right? You can't get away with raising the jack seven suited, for example. From the button, however, you get to raise a whole lot wider. That said, that said, notice from the button, in GTO world at least, you still can't raise any ace x. You can't raise the nine eight or the eight seven or the seven six offsuits but a lot of suited hands are pretty good. I think a lot of people don't realize quite how strong suited hands are. A lot of people, if you give them queen four suited or jack six suited on the button, they just open fold. And that's a mistake. That's definitely a mistake. So you want to make sure that you are playing good, strong, reasonable ranges, especially when you are the first player to enter the pot. And even more so, especially in cash games, where if you limp, they just take 10% of your money. You can't be giving away 10% of your money to the casino. All right, next. You want to be three betting constantly, frequently, aggressively. You want to be in there battling kind of hard. Let's take a look at these scenarios where three betting with a polarized range will let you stay very predictable. Take a look at this. So here we are on the button against a raise from the cutoff. Okay? This is when the but the cutoff raises and we are on the button, 100 big blinds deep. Notice we are three betting roughly queens and better, ace queen suited and better, and ace king to get all the money in. Jacks and tens are also not trying to fold. But all these other hands that are being three bet, these hands in red, all of these other hands are three betting with the intention of folding if the opponent four bets. You may be surprised at how many hands get to bluff in this situation. Notice ace jack, ace ten, king jack, king ten, a bunch of suited junky connected hands, suited aces, etc. You're going to find that as you get deeper and deeper and deeper stacked, that the GTO solver really likes to play the ace x suited and the king x suited aggressively. Okay? You're going to find that these are very, very good blocker bluffs, essentially. So you're going to find the hands in this region usually like three bet bluffing as you get deeper and deeper and deeper stacked. Because essentially, we're only really getting it in with aces and kings plus a few other hands, right? Notice the calls in this scenario. I think a lot of people also call far too wide. If you give them 9-7 suited, 10-7 suited, jack-10 offsuit, 4-3 suited, ace-7 offsuit. A lot of players just call these hands every time in the cutoff against a button raise in a cash game. But that is a big mistake. And you may say, but all my opponents call with all these hands. Why can't I? Well, the answer is all your opponents in small stakes games are losers. They are all losing. So do you want to copy the game? Of losing players? Do you want to copy losing player strategy? And I think the answer is no. One time, a long time ago, I wrote a poker book. I had it basically done. We sent it to an editor, a professional editor. And 
I think we were recommending two big blind raises in tournaments, right? They changed it to five big blind raise pre-flop. Why would they do that? Because that's how much they raise in their games that they play. It must be a mistake to raise the two big blinds. No, 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 no. I, you cannot believe how tilted I was when that happened because I had to go back and fix everything. <laughs> anyway, look, don't model your game and your strategy off players who are not winning at poker. Model your game off good, strong GTO poker and then logically adjust based on the things that you are seeing your opponents do incorrectly. And the players who are calling preflop raises with all sorts of junk are just spewing off money, especially in cash games where they have a rake right? You got to realize whenever you call with essentially any hand that's not in green here, you better have a good reason to think your opponent's going to be overly weak and tight and passive post-flop or a reason to believe they're just going to like load all of their money in such that you can make one pair and not fold and be thrilled about it, right? And small pocket pairs fell out of favor as polarized three bets. Small pocket pairs have never been good three bets. The only time small pairs are good three bets is when you can just shove them all in because you're 20 big blinds deep or so. You should not be three betting the small pairs. You'll find that they basically always call when you are in position. It's okay to use this solver in an online game. This is not a solver. This is a chart. Some sites allow charts. Some sites do not. Please consult the terms and conditions of the site that you play on. Limping is uh, pumping, according to Negranu. Limping's okay if you know what your opponents are going to do wrong. And it's okay if there's no rake in your game. I actually watched the video Negrani put out recently where he said he started open limping. And look, in super high-level poker world, if you have studied how to play limp pots way more than your opponents, and you think that the edge you're going to get from playing these limp pots is greater than... Basically, every, whenever you open limp, you're losing some EB, right? But if your opponents play post-flop or later in the hand so much worse because they're oblivious, they don't know how to play against limpers, then maybe you can make up that EV loss. The question is, is can you make up that EV loss? I think a lot of people, not necessarily saying Negranu, but I think a lot of people are a little bit egotistical and they think that they can outplay people more than so than they can. Did you guys see Phil Helmuth the other day? Phil Helmuth. Check called it off on the river with the king high. I think he thought he had ace high. He couldn't read his hand. What is up with people not being able to read their hands in 2022 and 2023? Have there been, has there ever been a year where so many people could not read their hands? What is happening? What is in the world is happening? Oh my gosh. All right. Anyway, you can't call all that wide, but when you do play in these scenarios, notice queen nine suited, jack nine suited, king suited. These are all hands that like to three bet, okay? Do not call so much be more inclined to three bet. If ever, or if anything, you should probably three bet even more than is recommended here because most people don't four bet enough. Just like most people don't three bet enough, most people don't four bet enough. Therefore, you can actually three bet more than these charts recommend. And you typically want to three bet more with the hands on the bottom portion of the range. So don't tell my opponents this, but if you give me any of these hands in red on the bottom portion of the range, I might three bet them almost every time, which is obviously very exploitable, but it's because I'm exploiting something I think the opponent's doing correctly. I think they don't four bet quite enough. Next, let's take a look at this scenario. Here we have 100 big blinds deep, small blind versus button. Button raises in a cash game. You're in the small blind. Where are all the calling hands? This chart must be wrong. There are no calling hands. Oh wait, there are no calling hands. This is a spot where you are not allowed to call. If you call in a cash game from the small blind against a raise from the button, when there's a rake in play, you're probably messing up. Because when you call, what's going to happen is you are going to sometimes get called by the big blind, which is not great. But either way, you're going to be playing out of position. And they're taking rake out of the pot. That is detrimental. Now, if you're playing in a tournament, it's certainly more reasonable to call from the small blind, especially as your opponents make it two big blinds pre-flop, right? Because then you're getting really good odds. And if there's an anti-team player, getting even better odds. But in a cash game, where they raise to three big blinds or three and a half big blinds or five big blinds like in some players' games, you just don't get to call from out of position. You're three betting or folding with a good, strong, linear range in general. Okay? This is good, strong GTO poker. All these charts and charts for basically every other preflop spot 
are available at pokercoaching.com in the GTO preflop program we have. It's also in the Poker Coaching app for premium members. So check it out. Now, what happens if you're against someone who does not fold to three bets? What if your opponent's a calling station? Let's go back to this scenario, cutoff versus button. So cutoff raises, we're on the button. How should we adjust this strategy here to logically take advantage of someone who is not going to fold to three bets? Because they're, they like calling and seeing if they make something. Take a second, think about it. Do I have a Discord? Yes, we do. Go to pokercoaching.com, click on the community tab. It'll come right up. Papu says, remove the bluffs. Almost, that's halfway there. Tighten up, play the top of our range. No. Take out the bluffs and make it value heavy. Almost. Bet more linear. More linear, more linear, more linear. More linear is the right answer. Essentially what more linear means is you start three betting stuff like ace-10 suited, ace-jack suited, king-queen suited, king-queen offsuit, ace-queen offsuit, ace-jack offsuit, pocket jacks, pocket tens, pocket nines, pocket eights. Basically, you just three bet all the best hands. And then... You stop bluffing so much. Maybe you don't bluff much at all. Notice all these hands that are actually bluffing are pretty reasonable calls. So what you should do is you should start three betting with something like ace-10 suited and better, ace-jack offsuit and better, king-queen, and something like pocket eights and better. Maybe king-jack suited and better, something like that. And so that is going to result in when they call your three bet, which I just told you they're not folding, they are going to be highly dominated, which is great. You're going to be dominating them hard in big pots. When they, well, when you call their initial raise, they're still going to have all their reasonable stuff in their range, and you're going to be fine because you're in position with stuff like queen nine suited, nine eight suited, small pairs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So that is also fine and good. And when they four bet you, you don't mind folding out something like ace jack, maybe even ace queen, because now you know when they four bet you, they don't really four bet a lot. They like the call. They probably have a very, very good hand. And that's going to result in you absolutely smashing them. So that's how you go about taking advantage of someone who just does not fold to preflop three bets. What are these colors? Red is re-raise, green is call, blue is fold. You're going to find that's basically the case in every GTO image that you look at. Okay? Sometimes the blue hands are in gray or white or something like that. But you're going to find that these charts are usually pretty logical. Red is almost always put more money in the pot. Okay? Oh, let's talk about one more thing. What happens if you think your opponent's going to play reasonably, except for you think they're not going to four bet quite enough? Therefore, when they four bet, they probably have a good hand. What should you do? How should you adjust this range when they four bet you? Basically, all you have in this range are the hands that are red, right? You would have called the green, you would have folded the blue, you're only left with the red. How should you adjust this range if you think your opponent's still going to call kind of often, but then they do four bet you? Always fold to four bet unless you are nutted, says Silhouette 415. That is pretty much accurate. If your opponent is only going to four bet with very good hands, when they do four bet, especially if they make it big, just get out of the way with everything except for probably queens and better and ace king. Maybe even tighter. Now look, <laughs> I hate folding. I hate folding. But look, if you tell me the guy's range is aces and kings, well then fold everything besides aces. Right? Would this apply to micro stakes online? Of course it would. Absolutely, of course it would. We're talking about how to crush small stakes games. These are three hacks today we're discussing to crush the small stakes games, okay? So anyway, if your opponents only put in four bets with the nuts, you got to get out of the way. I did a bankroll challenge a long time ago where I didn't realize at like five cent, 10 cent, no limit hold'em, some of these players were just super nitty. So I was just in the mode of three bet ace king and get it all in every time. But turns out ace king was a pretty big losing hand, not because I lost my flips, because they showed me aces or kings every time. And um, I learned that pretty quickly in those particular games. Now look, I'm always just three betting the ace king and getting it in in most normal games. But if you tell me over a decently large sample, they just have aces and kings when they four bet, I'm going to start three betting way more often because I'm not getting four bet very often at all. And when I do get four bet, I'm going to drastically overfold, right? That's how you go about crushing your opponents. It's a horribly unbalanced strategy. 
Because if you three bet and then fold to four bets a lot, well, all they have to do is four bet and crush you. But if they don't four bet, because nobody four bets in these games, unless they have the nuts, then they're not gonna crush you. Instead, you're the one exploiting them. Whenever you are getting out of line to exploit someone, you do have to be very, very careful that you don't get counter exploited. Because typically if someone does counter exploit you, they are gonna be counter exploiting you for more EV than what you were trying to exploit them for to begin with. But fortunately, especially in small stakes games, most players are just not, not getting out of line. They're just not doing it. So whenever they do 40 bet you, they have literally the best hands only. What about when you raise and everyone calls? Well, then just raise with a good, strong linear range, right? The nice thing about GTO preflop raising ranges like this one, take a look at this, low jack raising range. If everyone's going to call you, perhaps don't raise the hands at the bottom portion of the range. And uh, that's that. This is pre-recorded. Don't write in people's chat. It is pointless. Well, it was pre-recorded about two seconds before you saw it. The tough thing about the internet, it's not actually live. It's delayed two seconds. So um, I guess it was pre-recorded two seconds before you saw it. I think if I cut the feed, though, you still see that two seconds of content. So maybe it's live? All right, that's pre-flop hacks. Post-flop hacks. Let's talk about betting for thin value. And then when they want to put money in the pot, you overfold a ton. Most players in small stakes games are deathly afraid of getting bluffed. They don't really like to fold. Maybe I'm a small stakes player. I don't really like to fold. And yet, they rarely bluff themselves. That's not true about me. I bluff a lot. So, it's time to exploit the players who call a lot and don't really bluff a lot. You're going to hear a lot of people in a lot of small stakes games say things like, oh, I knew I was beat, but I just had to see it. And then they call, and then they see the nuts, and they're like, oh, okay, knew they saw it. And you have to realize that some of these people believe that it is better to sleep at night, to know that they didn't make a mistake, or they, 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 to know that they didn't make a bad fold. They'd rather call and lose their money and know they didn't make a bad fold than fold and not know. The tough thing about folding is you don't actually know if you made a good fold or not. And that, that is a difficult thing. I get that for a lot of people, right? But these players are terrible, and you are going to crush them. Poker is a game of uncertainty. You're not going to know if you made the right play 100% of the time, every time. And if you want a game like that, well, go to chess or something. Poker's not for you. But this post-flop hack of betting for thin value and then overfolding when they do decide to re-raise you is going to result in you absolutely crushing your opponents. We have a question. If everyone uses this strategy, well, they certainly don't, and this kind of poker play, isn't it easier to play against that person? I mean, look, anytime you announce your strategy to your opponent, you're going to be easier to play against. Unless, of course, you announce you're playing the GTO strategy, then, you know, your opponents are just going to break even or lose. But you don't announce your strategy whenever you show up at the table. That's not how poker works. When you show up at the table, you don't say, all right, everybody, I'm going to value bet you super thin, and if you raise me at any point, I'm going to get out of the way. Typically, most people don't announce that. What does thin value mean? Does that mean 40% pot? No, that means betting with hands that are non-super -pre non premium, right? With the idea that if I get raised, I'm going to fold them because the opponent's going to call with far worse hands. It doesn't necessarily mean anything about the size of the bet. It means I'm betting thinner for value than GTO would go. It says GTO is useless in small stakes. It's important to realize that in a lot of scenarios, the GTO strategy informs the strategy you should actually be using. If you don't know where to adjust from, you're not, not going to know where to adjust to. I think a lot of people think they can just ride by the seat of their pants in 2023. And maybe you can against the worst players and still win some money. But I'm trying to teach all of you to absolutely crush the opponents. All right, here we raise the king-queen offsuit. We're playing one two no limit. We already are exploiting. We make it five big blinds. Pretty big raise. Making a big raise like this typically presumes that the opponents are going to call big raises with far too much nonsense, okay? Top pair. I can already tell you, I can already tell you, before this hand plays out, we are going to bet the flop and bet the turn and bet the river unless it runs out really bad. And if they raise us on the turn of the river, the right play is probably going to be to fold. This is A, B, C, 
post-flop poker at 1-2 No Limit Hold'em because most players will call far too often whenever you bet the flop and the turn in the river, as long as you don't go too big. They need 500 likes for a free ebook. Oh, hit the like button, I guess. <laughs> Just give it all away today. Happy Valentine's Day, everyone. Enjoy the free stuff. At my kid's school, some teachers allowed candy in their class and some did not. My boy Thomas came home with about 100 pieces of candy. My boy James came home with none. <laughs> what a world. It's kind of like poker. You can both play well, but some of you get some candy and some of you get nothing. Enjoy. All right. In this scenario, we continuation bet the flop, obviously. On calls. Notice we can go for a small bet here. Just pushing our range advantage. Turns of five of hearts. This is a pretty bad turn for us. It's a bad turn for us because we don't have the 8-6 suited in our range. Or we don't have the 8-6 off suit. Maybe we got splashy with the 8-6 suited. But we definitely don't have the 6-3 suited. But the opponent does, right? So this is a spot where... I think King-Queen should probably bet again. But it's not an, an obviously easy bet. That said, we just bet again. If they do raise us, we'll just let it go. Now, if you tell your opponents when you sit down at the table, I'm going to value bet the king-queen here, and if you raise me, I'm going to fold. Well, that's not going to work out so well for you, right? But you're not telling them that. They don't know that. They're just going to call with all sorts of nonsense. They call. River's a nine of spades. This river's fine. Wait, we're giving a free ebook to everyone? I thought it was one person. We're giving a free ebook to literally everyone? All right, well, happy Valentine's Day. Enjoy it. Free stuff for everyone. Okay. All right. On the river. Nine of spades, they check. I think this is a spot where in a small stakes cash game, we have a very easy value bet. Most people, however, check it back. They're worried about being beat. The great thing about this scenario is that when they check and you bet, they're still going to call with king jack, king 10, king 8. King six, some sevens, some nines, right? They're not gonna have a ton of nines, but they're, they're gonna find hero calls as long as you don't bet too big. So this is a spot where we definitely should go for value. So many players in small six games is check this back, they roll it over and they miss out on probably four, five, six, eight big blinds of EV on average. Obviously, sometimes you bet you're gonna get raised. Sometimes you're gonna bet you're gonna get called by worse or get called by better. But this is a very, very clear value bet for, for like a medium bet, like $35 or $40. You don't want to blast it. You don't want to bet $75 or all in because, yeah, then you're only going to get called when you're beat. But if you bet medium, they're going to call with all sorts of stuff. What's the catch? How can you give a free ebook? Well, I've made a lot of ebooks. At some point, you can start giving them away for free. Also, it does cost you something. You have to enter your email address so I can send it to you. Sorry about that. Maybe it's not free. You have to pay an email address. Tough life. What do you do if he re-raises you? You fold. Fold. You were going to fold on the turn if they raised you. This is a situation where most players in most games, when they check raise, they just almost always have you beat. Because they're worried about you having the nuts, right? Remember, if we went back to the slide, it said most of these players are just trying to not fold. They want to be able to sleep at night. No, they didn't get bluffed out of a pot. And they're going to call with whatever medium strength hand they have, which makes a whole lot of sense for them to have given they check call the flop and check call the turn. And we are going to crush them. Why not bet, check, bet? Why would we check the turn? We have the best hand almost every time. Given we have the best hand almost every time, why would we want to lose value? We have a hand that is near the top of our range. And the opponent has done nothing to indicate that they beat us at all. They called pre-flop with a bunch of junk. They check called the flop. Fine, we're smashing them. The turn's a five. Yeah, it's not great. If we bet and they raise us, we can fold because they're not going to bluff us. Again, we're not announcing ahead of time that we're going to fold anytime they raise us. The opponents do not know that, right? This is a very, very nice spot to just bet flop, bet turn, bet river. Check back the turn so they can catch up. No, you don't want to check back the turn because there's actually a lot of bad rivers for us. Any heart is bad. Any seven, five, or four is bad. Any eight, six, or three is bad. There's a whole lot of bad rivers. But what if you bet the river and get raised? We already said that. You're going to fold. The players are not going to... Come on, everybody, sit here and think about this. I want you to be honest with yourselves. On the river, 
how often have you bet the river and then your opponent shoves all in with you and then you called them and then they showed you nothing? How often has that really happened? Take a second, think about it. Be honest with yourselves. Be honest with yourselves. How often does that happen? I play high stakes games against players who are closer to the GTO solver than almost anybody. And it doesn't happen all that often. Basically never, right? I agree with Bapo. Basically never LMAO. It's pretty rare at 1-3. I agree. Nobody bluffs. I agree. Happens all the time with Eric Pearson. He plays high six games and he's crazy. Different kind of player. We're talking about the generic 1-2 or 1-3 or $200 tournament player. In general, they very rarely bluff raise the river. Yeah, okay, so you all get it, right? So if they're only going to raise with the nuts, but they're going to call with many inferior hands, this is an easy spot to bet the river and then fold if they raise you. You've seen people shove with a weaker king. What, for like dumb value? No, don't. That would be terrible. You think you jam with a7 a diamond? No, that would be also be terrible. So look, why are the opponents going to turn top pair or middle pair into a bluff? That would be ridiculous. Now, to be fair, maybe they are ridiculous. And if you're against somebody who's ridiculous, then sure. Then sure, right? Bet and then call it off if they're going to be check-raising with all sorts of worse hands. Most people, though, when they check-raise the river, if they're playing anywhere near logically, they're going to have either a better hand than our hand or nothing. And most people don't check-raise with nothing. Does this concept apply to tournaments too? Yes, of course it does. Oh, man, I ran a savage check-raise all-in when there were like 14 people left in the PCA main event the other day. Ooh, it was good. And the stream cut out. <laughs> The internet in the Bahamas is no, uh, known to be not amazing. And I check raised all in on the river. It was so good. I blocked middle pair and the nut flush. The opponent snap folded. I probably had the best hand on the pair, to be fair. I didn't even get to show it. Didn't even get to show it to the camera. You feel like there's also overvaluing happening here. They raise because they think they are nutted. So they're valuing themselves. I mean, look, again, if your opponents are so bad to the point that they are going to check raise all in with king jack well then obviously call off far wider right again this all goes back to the idea take advantage of what your opponents do wrong okay let's take a look at another hand king jack suited early position raises we have an easy call top pair oh we don't we're not suited we're off suited can't even read the board okay well, gosh what's happening in 2023 did all of our eyes just break in 2023 no one can read the cards anymore, myself included. How many times do you think we've already misread our hands in 2023? Seven times? 15 times? I don't know. I'm deathly afraid of it at this point. I mean, everybody's misreading their hand. If the great Phil Helmuth, the best self-proclaimed poker player who has ever lived, cannot read his cards in 2023, already all the way in February, what hope do any of us have? Do not know. Four color deck. You know the problem with the four color deck? I don't know if people know this. Slash show. Whenever you have a four color deck, the problem is when you pitch the cards and they flash just a little bit, you can't really tell if this is a spade or a club, right? And funny enough, the red cards actually kind of look like black cards if they go kind of fast, right? Like, look, can you tell that's red? Definitely red. Can you tell that's red? Not really. But, but, when you start adding other colors, it becomes way easier to see if they're blue or green. And a lot of dealers in a lot of places kind of think, they think they're playing throw the card to the ceiling and make it land in front of the player. And that's why they don't use a four-color deck today. Yeah, online, use a four-color deck. All right. Check, call, flop, obviously. Check, ugh. Check, call, turn, obviously. How many tournaments out of 200 can you expect to win? How many players are in the tournament? If there's six players in each tournament, you should expect to win a lot. If there's 4,000 players in each tournament, zero. 0. 0.02 or something. All right, probably more than that. All right, river uh, turn, we check call. River's native spades, we check, they bet again. By that logic, they should be using black and white cards. Red and, I just told you red and black look the same. If red and black look the same to the naked eye when you're pitching them like this, then uh, why would you use a black and white deck? You want to use as many colors as you reasonably can. But I've seen it. I've seen it in real life. I've seen this in action with a four-color deck of pa paper cards. I've seen a four-color deck of paper cards. You can tell. If a club's going this green, you can tell that's a club. 
Not so well with black and red. Funny, you'd think you'd be able to tell, but you can't. Anyway, on this river, what do we do? This is an annoying spot. Uh, this is a spot where I, Jonathan Little, just don't like folding. Against a good, strong, world-class player, I just don't like folding. But we're playing 1-2 No Limit Hold'em against a player who probably just doesn't like to bluff. We don't even beat King-10. Of course we don't beat King-10. King-10 is the nuts. This is a spot in small stakes, no limit hold'em, where I think we have a trivially easy fold. It's not even close. Even I would fold here, and I'm a calling station. This is an easy fold. This is a good example of a spot where a lot of people, they want to be able to sleep at night. They have the top pair. How could they possibly fold top pair? It's one of the best hands they can have. Eh, kind of. It's one of the best hands they can have. Well, while that's true, it doesn't really matter because the opponent is going to be drastically under bluffing and, and, well, they're just not betting worse. And they're not bluffing. Find some bluffs. What bluffs are they going to be bluffing, really? Seriously, take a second. Find some bluffs here. Even Jack-9 got here. Jack-9, oh wait, Jack-9 is a bluff on the flop, right? And that, that got there. What, you think they have like the ace, ace four of diamonds and they're just tripling it off? I mean, they could, but they're probably not. You think they have the, the seven six of spades and they're just tripling it off? Probably not. You think queen-jack. I think queen-jack would be a horribly bad river bet and we block it. This is a spot where I doubt anyone is value betting with a queen. That'd be absurd. You think they're taking middle pair and bluffing it? Most people don't bluff pairs in small stakes games. By the way, that's a it's far off from today's topic, but most players in most small stakes games don't bluff with middle pair. They just don't do it. They just never bluff with middle pair. They see pair and they think, showdown value, thank you, check it back, give me the pot. And there you go. Anyway, easy fold here. Just fold and let it go. When they bet the flop and bet the turn and bet the river, they're announcing they have a very good hand. Please get out of the way. Hack number three. Here's our number one bankroll hack. Poker is not a get-rich-quick scheme. I must have said this exact phrase a thousand times in 2022 and a hundred thousand times since I started talking to people about poker. It is not a get-rich-quick scheme. It's not. I know. You see, people like Chris Moneymaker, buying for $25. Next thing you know, he has a million dollars or two and a half million dollars, whatever they gave him. I don't even know. A million dollars only for him? That's unlucky. Um, it's not a get-rich-quick scheme. Some people get rich from poker, but most people do not. What's the skill difference between 1, 2, and 2, 5, 25 NL, and 50 NL, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? How good do you need to be to crush each one? Look, as you move up, people are going to get better. Simple as that. How do you gain an edge over all the people who are in this stream? Work harder and study harder. Everybody in this stream, I can tell you what they're going to do. After the stream's over, they're going to go. It's almost 5 o'clock in America. They're going to have a beer. They're going to have some dinner. They're going to watch TV, and they're going to go to sleep. You, go study. I'm dealing with this with my child, James, right now. He wants to learn to play chess. He went to a chess tournament the other day, and... He was playing against like the best player from each school. You could look and tell these people are serious. <laughs> these are not, they're not playing around. I'm like, look, look, if he wants to play chess and he wants to win against these kids, he's gonna have to really devote. Like really devote. And I don't know if I really want him to really devote because <laughs> it's a lot of work on my part. But uh, how do you get better than the other people here? The answer is you work harder and you study harder. I'm not much smarter than anybody else here but I study a whole lot more and I work a whole lot more than almost everybody. I'm happy to put in maximum hours. I do not mind. I like it. I'm happy to grind harder and work harder than most people. That is my skill. And if you look at a lot of the best poker players in the world, they're kind of in the same boat. They're, they're not, I mean, they're like easily kind of smart, but they're not super geniuses, but they're willing to sit down and do the work. That's how you win at poker. You sit down, and you do the work. Are these hacks good for tournaments? Of course they are. All right, let's discuss some steps to improve your bankroll habits. By the way, I started with $50, 5-0. Look, just sitting here on my desk, I have doubled my net worth from when I first started, okay? I've, I've met many times my net worth from when I first started. I started with literally, literally this amount. Isn't that nuts? I obviously have an, a house. <laughs> what a world. I started with $50 back in 2003. And I have never been anywhere near broke. I've had some times where I've had to move down a lot, 
but I've never been anywhere near broke. And I did that by realizing you make money in poker by consistently playing in games where you have an edge, period. And being properly bankrolled. Weird flex. That is a weird flex. It's a weird flex, right? But it's true. I started with $50 when I was 18. I had like no money. That's like 10K today with inflation, LOL. <laughs> it's probably true. <laughs> oh God, 0 0.002 ETH. That's all I started with. All right, so look, all you gotta do is play a lot in games you have a consistent edge in over and over and over and you'll win. Nobody wants to do that though. They wanna try to take their 50 and turn it into 10,000 today. They wanna take 50 and turn it into 10,000 right now. And if they don't, they're gonna be mad about it. So let's talk about some steps to improve your bankroll. First, get rid of your ego. And focus on the long term. It's a long term game. Back when I used to play a ton, I would play a lot of sit and goes. And I knew when I played sit and goes, I would win maybe $3 per game. Three. But I would play 200 of them a day. What's three times 200? Is anybody good at math here? It's like a decent win rate for a kid who's 18 years old, right? And I would grind it out. Grind it, grind it, grind it, grind it, grind it. Over and over and over. I wasn't even good at poker back then. And I found a game where I had an edge and I just played it as much as I could. Now those days are long gone because uh, I made a training site that taught people how to beat sit and goes a long time ago. Sorry. But there's still plenty of opportunities to crush poker. Cash games are very soft at the small stakes, especially live. Tournaments are still highly profitable. They make all these random games all the time. They're usually good if they're not raking them to death. So anyway, understand... The goal is not to get rich today. The goal is to get rich in time. Next, understand that cash games are just one long session. So many people get mad whenever they lose on the last hand of the day because they would have been up for the day. It does not matter if you're up or down for the day. The day is irrelevant. The week is irrelevant. The month is irrelevant, et cetera, et cetera. Singles are still profitable at the small stakes. Sure. I'm going to challenge you, though, Matthew. Thank you for being here, by the way. I appreciate all of you being here. If you're happy to be here, if you've enjoyed today's show, click the like button, click the subscribe button. I know we got off to a rocky start, but here we are. Be careful devoting a lot of time learning a game that probably does not have a good future. A long time ago, back when I was crushing sit and goes, I met the biggest winner at Potlum at Omaha, six-handed sit and goes in the world by a lot. He was, he, and I looked him up. He was the biggest winner by a mile. The problem, though, is that only about three $30 six-handed pot limit Omaha sit and goes ran each day. And he was up about $4,000. And he was the best one. He was the best one. So if the biggest winner in the four or the $30 buy-in six-handed pot limit Omaha sit and goes is only up $4,000, well, you worked really hard to learn a skill and that skill is kind of useless. So I'm not saying sit and goes are useless. If you look at a lot of the best players in the world today, they came from sit and goes. Sit and goes are great at teaching you pound implications. And that's very, very important. I mean, I learned a ton about them. Maybe too much to some extent. It makes me rip it in too much, as you all saw the other day when I was in the Bahamas. But I, I would recommend most people today don't learn sit and goes for exactly that reason. Is PLO really the game of the future? Well, maybe in... 25, 23, it may be the game of the future. I highly doubt it, though. I actually spent a lot of time learning singles, or a lot learning PLO back in the day when I thought it was the game of the future. About uh, 15 years ago, I would spend a ton of time learning PLO. I got pretty good at it. I've had some deep run in PLO tournaments. But is it the game of the future? I don't know. The problem is live is really slow, and it's kind of a rake trap because when you get it in, you're like 55% equity. You get in with 55%, and they're raking 5%, you're not going to make it. All right, anyway, next. Don't focus on locking up wins. So many people quit early in games that are otherwise good because they just want to go home a winner. Again, get that out of your mind. Next, track your wins and losses. Also, track the time you spend. You can do this in a simple program like Excel. That's what I do. I write down how many hours I play in the day. I write down how much I bought in for, right, and how much I won or lost. And to be fair, that's not even all that rigor rigorously. There was an app on the phone called Poker Journal. I don't know if they still update it. They, they stopped updating it for a while. I'm sure there's some program out there. You know what? I know, I know someone here is listening from my team. We need to make a poker bankroll 
tracking app that keeps track of everything, like Poker Journal used to do. So definitely check that out. Definitely make sure that you keep track of what you're winning or losing because it's important. If you put in a thousand hours and you win a thousand dollars, well, you may feel good about it, but you only want a dollar an hour. It's not a good return on investment and return on time, right? Use poker income. Okay, poker income. Maybe people look up poker income. I honestly don't know. What should you set min and max session time? Look, what I would do whenever I used to play poker, uh, I used to play poker. When I used to play poker every day at Bellagio, I would show up at noon and I would play until midnight. And if the game was good, I would play later. But if the game was not exceptionally good, I'd be done at midnight. If I was only caring about poker back then, which back then I even realized that I did not entirely care about money. But if I entirely cared about money, I'd show up at something like three o'clock and play till like four or 5 a.m. I think that's probably ideal. And then stay longer if the game is good. Because the noon games are never good. The, the purpose of showing up at noon is to make sure you have a seat for the game for the rest of the day. You all want a poker bankroll tracker app. Well, good. Poker income is a good app. Poker base is a good app. There's a bunch of good apps. All right, fine, good. Use them. Next, consider, I'm not going to say to do it, but consider setting a stop loss. A stop loss means that when you are down X amount, you pack it up and you're done. Usually three buy-in slash 300 big blinds. Back when I played five, 10, no limit, you could buy in for 1,500. And if I got down 4,500, 450 big blinds, I would usually quit for the day. Not always. It usually depended on how I lost. Like if I just got in with aces three times preflop and lost, like whatever, you know, just running bad. But if the game is not great and I'm just losing, well, if you think about it, if I'm losing and the game obviously is not great, it kind of presumes there's not much of a win rate to be had here, right? So if there's not much of a win rate to be had here, then why am I playing? And that's kind of what a stop loss does. But if you're kind of new to poker, if you're playing the small stakes games, the stop loss also helps to ensure you don't really play when you're on tilt. If you can just set this one rule in your head, if I get down 300 big blinds, I'm leaving, period. Then as long as that does not adversely impact your play while you're actually playing, such that you, let's just say, don't stop bluffing or that you, you know, you're scared to value bet thinly, whatever. Then I think this is probably a pretty good thing for most poker players. As you get better and better, I think stop losses become asinine. Now, everyone's going to take this out of context and think that they're the best player and it's going to say, oh, that doesn't apply to me. And then they're going to go from there. Even today, though, like if, if you tell me I'm going to play a game and I lose a lot, I'm going to be careful. There are also times where you should be extra careful. Like say you're playing on an unlicensed, unregulated site. Say you're playing in a random home game with people you don't know, right? These are spots where maybe things get funny. Maybe they get funny at particular times. You don't know. So... Protect yourself before you wreck yourself, right? Next, be flexible with the stakes you play. Whenever things go poorly, move down. I told you all a long time ago, I've never went broke, but but I did come close to going broke. Eh, not really close, but I lost like half my money, right? I took some of my money and I bought a condominium and then I had the rest of my money and I lost like half of the rest of my money. And but what did I do? Did I keep playing my regular games? No, I moved down. I moved actually way down because I, believe it or not, despite my high level of degeneracy in life, I am the opposite of a degenerate with my poker bankroll. I don't know how or why, but I really, 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 really don't want to lose my ability to earn money in the future. I love the idea of knowing that I can sit down, find a game, grind the game, and know I can make 50 or or $100 an hour Worst case, worst case. And that's kind of the worst case I have in my life today, which is good. If that's the worst case I have, then we're in pretty good shape, right? And I want that for all of you. But in order to get there, you have to be flexible when things are going poorly. Things will inevitably go poorly. Everything's not gonna just be straight up in life, especially if you play tournaments. Even in cash games though, things are not always gonna be straight up. So sometimes you have to move down and that's okay, be willing to. What happens to a lot of people is let's say they decide they're winning two five players and they have, I don't know, $15,000. They play two five, they play two five, they're winning, they're winning, they get to 30,000, they think they're smashing the game, they're gonna move up to five ten now. Fine, I'm not against it. They play, they win up to 35,000, 
They lose down to 28,000. They lose down to 14,000. Then they decide, you know what? I know I'm down. I'm running poorly. I'm going to keep playing 510. Next thing you know, they're broke. Despite actually being a very clearly winning 2-5 player who could easily make $50 an hour, they took their obviously clear, profitable situation and they threw it in the garbage because they have ego problems. Please don't have ego problems, everyone. Even the pros don't follow bankroll management. Some do, some don't. Funny enough, I remember reading a book a long time ago by Doyle Brunson. And it was almost like he was proud of going broke many, many times. And I think back in the day, people just didn't care if they went broke because they really didn't care about money. They were super degens. But I have a group chat in my phone with about seven poker pros who've been playing with me since I was about 18 years old. And <laughs> Valentine's Day, have fun, enjoy yourselves. And um, none of them have ever been anywhere near broke. Some of them have been in and out of poker because they've had better opportunities come up, but none of them have ever been anywhere near broke, despite most of their income coming from poker. Now, how and why is this that the people that I associated myself with just happen to be nowhere near broke? Funny enough, we actually have a uh, go broke bet with each other, where if you go broke, we will give each other $10,000. So if I go broke, I am going to get about $70,000 in my pocket to try to figure out something, not to degen away, but to, you know, go to college and pay your bills for a year or two, right? And none of us have ever claimed it. It's never even been anywhere close. And I think there's something to be said about surrounding yourselves with like-minded people who really just want to get rich slowly. And it turns out we've all kind of got rich slowly. Sometimes, you know, sometimes not necessarily from poker, but in our own ways, we're always looking for good spots. You're trying to uh, extract value from situations where people are making mistakes or opportunities that arise. And none of us have been anywhere near broke, right? And that that's good. I started when I was 18. You must be very late to this. Well, look, it's never too late. It's never too late. But you got to realize you're probably behind. If you're new to this, you're probably behind. So you better get to work. Here's my cash game bankroll baseline. This is from pokercoaching.com slash bankroll. We have tournament uh, bankroll baselines there as well. Make sure you check that out. Your bankroll is essentially, for simplicity, determined by how much you win per 100 hands. Now, how do you know how much you win per 100 hands? You observe your win rate, which goes back to that point I said earlier. You keep track of how you've done in the past, right? Say you've played a thousand hours in the past and you observe that you win 20 big blinds per 100 hands, well, then you probably need about 2,500 big blinds for your game. This is uh, presuming we're playing one to no limit, okay? So one to no limit. If you're um, crushing it, if you're winning at 25 big blinds per 100 hands, you need about 2,000 big blinds only. It's actually not a lot. 4,000 bucks for one to no limit. Now, when you're playing live, you're going to play about 30 hands per hour, okay? So this 25 big blinds per hour means you're winning at about eight or nine or 10 big blinds per, I'm sorry, eight or nine, big, eight or, nine or 10 big blinds per hour equals 25 big blinds per 100 hands, okay? So is 25 big blinds per 100 realistic? Absolutely, yes. I did it at 5, 10, and 10, 20 for many years. My students are doing it today in 5, 10, and 2, 5 in all sorts of localities, all around live poker. Is 30 hands per hour live actually accurate? Well, look, to be fair, to some extent, you control it, right? I always grimace anytime I see a pro playing overly slowly in a cash game because you make money per hand dealt. So play fast and deal a lot of hands. Keep the game moving. I mean, I, I mean, the other day I played a 50, 100, 200, 1,000 game here locally, and we probably played 40 hands per hour. Like, it was going. It was going. Nobody tanked. Nobody took their time. It was good. But no, 30 hands an hour I think is reasonable if you are fast and you are controlling the game. Now, I realize a lot of people think, oh, it's the dealer's job to control the game. But, eh, it's kind of the player's job to control the game. S. Clem says, you're the dealer. 30 to 35 is reasonable. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's on the fast side. But imagine you have two or three players at the table who are moving it along, right? You can move it along. 
These numbers are very high for online poker, by the way. Online poker is substantially tougher than live poker. That should be obvious, but maybe it's not. Online poker is way more difficult than live poker for many reasons. The most obvious one is you get to play way more hands, and that forces the bad players to go broke quicker in terms of time. Okay? If a losing player deposits $50 into an online site and they play 5 cent, 10 cent, no limit, they're going to be broke in a day, basically every time. But if you take a 1, 2, no limit player and you give them $1,000, they're not going to lose $1,000 in a day, even if they're terrible, right? So that results in live poker being way softer than online poker. And it is today and it's always been the case. There's no debate about this. So... Just understand, right? If you're playing online, maybe five big blinds per hour is a great win rate, right? So if you're playing five big blind, if, if you're winning five big blinds per hour, just realize you need a bigger bankroll because you're gonna have way more variance. You've lost nine hundred fifty dollars in a day at one two. Ask me anything. Yeah, good job. I mean, look, we've all had bad days. I mean, I've had bad days. Everybody's had bad days. It's part of life. Get over it. Such is life. Enjoy. So anyway, as your win rate goes up, you need a smaller bankroll because your edge is higher, essentially. In tournaments, as your win rate goes up, you need a smaller bankroll, but tournaments are a little bit different than cash games in that as the field size gets bigger, you also need a bigger bankroll. So if you're playing 81-person tournaments locally, you probably don't need all that big of a bankroll. But if you're playing 3,000-person tournaments, you're going to need a humongous bankroll. Because you don't win 3,000 person tournaments all that often. Sorry, you just don't. So that's that. Keep that in mind. You can check that out at pokercoaching.com slash bankroll. So that is it. Three hacks to crush live poker. Number one, be more aggressive pre-flop. Number two, go for a thin value and overfold a lot post-flop and practice good bankroll management. And if you use these three hacks today in 2023, you're going to enjoy a large bankroll boost that these hacks give you. I want to make sure that you make the most of the games that are available today because they are soft. I love all of you. I'm happy with all of you. Today is Valentine's Day, and I appreciate all of you immensely. And so we already gave the free ebook. Why not get 58% off of pokercoaching.com? Right now, you can join and get access to over 700 classes, 1,800 interactive hand quizzes, and a whole lot more from my hand-selected team of world-class pros who have over $75 million in live tournament earnings. Wow, that's a lot. That's a lot of earnings. You can check it out right now at pokercoaching.com slash valentines. You can join now. Currently, we have 13 multi-part series from a wide range of pros. By the way, these pros were selected by me to teach either, in my mind, past Jonathan Little exactly what he needed to learn or also present-day Jonathan Little to teach me what I need to learn. I'm pretty good at poker, but I'm always working hard to improve and I'm happy to hire the best poker players and coaches in the world to make content for me that I can then give to you. We all win together. Speaking of winning, poker coaching coaches have been smashing it this year. Even I took $170,000 away from the Bahamas. That's lucky. Huge congrats to Aram Zobian who won the $10,000 buy-in Poker Go Cup just the other day for $200 thousand dollars. Good job. Good work. He has a course on pokercoaching.com he recently released in large field poker tournaments. He took sixth place in the 2018 World Series of Poker main event for $1.8 million. He's had a few other deep runs and super large field events since. And we have this course that will teach you how to make deep runs in these large terms, or at least give you the best chance to. Sometimes you're going to lose, of course. But Aram uses massively exploitative play, and he navigates the different stages of the tournaments very, very well. So make sure you check that out. This course is not for sale. It is only for Poker Coaching Premium members. And if you sign up right now at pokercoaching.com slash valentines, you'll have access to it. Also, congrats to Brock Wilson. He's been winning everything. The most recent thing was a deep run in the $25,000 buy-in PCA high roller just a few days ago. Good job, good work to him. He has been working hard with Rampage Poker, who won a $10,000 tournament as well just the other day. I'm telling you, everyone is winning. <laughs> it's kind of nuts. How would you like to be a fly in the wall and learn what Brock has been teaching Rampage that has resulted in Rampage crushing the games? Well, they did a lot of coaching together, one-on-one -on -one coaching that we recorded 
for all of my students. I want to be a fly on the wall. And I presume a lot of you would like to be a fly on the wall too and learn what Brock is selling Rampage is resulting in a punter-like Rampage somehow winning at poker. So check it out. Also, Poker Coaching Premium members have full access to Brock Wilson's Advanced Tournament Series. I learned a lot going through his content. I mean, look, Brock's one of the best poker players in the world. I try to hire the best poker players in the world, and I'm very, very happy that we have content from Brock because if you want to learn what one of the best poker players in the world is doing to consistently crush the high-stakes games, well, check it out. If you join right now, you get access to over 700 classes where we discuss very specific things, right? Like, for example, how to play three-bet pots out of position in a tournament, presumably. Also, we review students' hands. We review coaches' hands. We discuss situations where, um, like, you're trying to figure out how to classify specific player types and how to exploit those specific player types, right? Also, we have over 1,800 interactive quizzes. I love talking poker with other good players. And the quizzes are the closest thing to that, where you play a hand, and then you get real-time feedback. And you figure out, am I doing the right thing? And if you see that you're getting a lot of situations correct on the flop, maybe you're actually pretty good at the flop. But if you get a lot of spots wrong on the river, you're probably bad at the river and you need to go study those scenarios more. <laughs> Man, just get to the point. Pokercoaching.com slash valentines. Go check it out. For those who do not know, I had an inner circle that I ran for about five years where every two weeks, I would have one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions with the people in the inner circle. They all let me record all these sessions so that I could share them with all of you. Kind of like a group learning thing, you know? All of us are trying to get good together. I share some of these videos with the people who are poker coaching members and also on my email list. And after they watch those, 79% of the people said that they think that watching these on a regular basis will substantially improve their game. The other 21% said they think it improved it a little, and the, there was nobody who said it would not improve their game. You have to realize, watching people learn poker and getting actionable advice to help them improve their skills substantially is very, 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 very valuable. So, the inner circle is no longer available, but if you sign up for poker coaching today, Bonus number one, we are going to give you access to over 240 hours of one-on-one -on -one coaching that I do with my inner circle members of, with players of all skill levels. Some of them were relatively novice. Some of them were good, strong, world-class players. Some of them are the biggest winners in American online poker today, interestingly enough. So make sure you check that out. Bonus number two. My kids are home and screaming. That's nice. Happy Valentine's Day. <clears throat> If you sign up at pokercoaching.com slash valentines right now, we're going to give you a year of Poker Go for free. I love Poker Go. I watch it all the time. High Stakes Poker is out now. I've been watching every episode of High Stakes Poker. I watch all the final tables that take place in the Poker Go studio, mainly for studying purposes. It's a great study resource. And if you sign up right now at pokercoaching.com slash valentines, you'll get Poker Go for free for a year, just included. It's not free. I have to pay for it, but you know, I'm happy to do that. So anyway, here's what we're offering. We're giving you nice discounts on a three-month, six-month, one-year, or two-year membership to PokerCoaching.com. $997 for two years. That seems very, very cheap. 58% off. Well, that, that does sound cheap. It's normally $100 a month, $99 a month if you want to be marketing. But you can get a three-year membership for $198, and you see how it goes up from there. But I'm going to do you one better. If you do not like PokerCoaching.com, if you, in theory, do not double your investment in the first month, if at any time in the first 30 days, for whatever reason, you do not think Poker Coaching Premium is right for you, send me an email at support at PokerCoaching.com within 30 days of buying, and we will give you a full refund. If you don't like it, it's free. You don't really know what else you want from me. Literally free if you don't like it for whatever reason. So check it out right now, pokercoaching.com slash Valentine's. You want to say hello? Come here. Oh, 
This is my big boy, Thomas. He's not little anymore. Can you say hello? Hello. You have fun outside? Mm -hmm. Happy Valentine's Day. Are you being shy? I want a cookie. All right, goodbye. I want, I want that blue cookie. So anyway, that's it for today. That's what I have for you. Check it out at pokercoaching.com slash valentines. Good luck. Have fun. Make the most of your opportunities. Tell someone you love them. What are you doing? We're in the middle of a show. You want to say hello too? If one says hello, the other has to say hello. Am I right? Am I right or? Oh my, you're really heavy. Am I right or am I right? Happy Valentine's Day. Talk right. Happy Valentine's. Why are you being shy? There's only a thousand people here looking at you. What? <laughs> all right, that's it for today. Good luck, have fun. If you enjoyed today's show, click the like button, click the subscribe button. Happy Valentine's Day to all of you. Check it out at pokercoaching.com slash valentines. There's never a better time to improve your skills than today. And if you're not working hard to get better at the game, I have bad news for you. You're going to be behind because everybody else is working on their game. Every poker player who is serious, to some extent, is working to improve their skills. And I have consolidated all the information that I know and that all my world-class coaches know. And I'm just giving it right to you. I do my best to make it easy for you to get as good at poker as you possibly can quickly. So check it out at pokercoaching.com slash valentines. Good luck. Have fun. Thank you all for being here. Click the like and subscribe button below before you leave. And I'll talk to you all next time. Bye-bye.